Ooh, we're going to have to buckle up for this one, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Top three scariest run-ins with unknown predators missing 411 part 14. Back with Mr. Ballin. Again, appreciate you guys coming over. For those of you who may have seen these already, appreciate y'all watching again with me. Also, make sure you guys are subscribed to his channel. This brother is amazing. Shout out to all the good humans. We ain't gonna waste no more time. Let's jump right into it. If you weren't already afraid of the woods, you will be by the end of this video. Oh, no. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please release a massive... <laughs> a massive saltwater crocodile. <laughs> wow. So if that's of interest to you, please release a massive saltwater crocodile inside of the like button's house. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. I'm glad he All right, let's in. get into today's stories. On August 2nd, 1963, four-year-old Bobby Panknan, along with his two older brothers and his two parents, headed off to a camping resort on Deep Lake in Washington State. The following day, Mrs. Panknan, whose name was Edna, decides she wants to take her three sons down a logging road that was right behind their campsite that she had heard fed out to this beautiful little waterfall that she thought her sons would like to see. Edna gets the boys ready, she says bye to Mr. Panknan, and then she and her sons take off down this logging road. And as soon as she's on the road, it occurs to her that it's totally overgrown, the grass is really high, it's you know rocky and bumpy, and she's thinking to herself, there's no way any vehicle is getting down this road, and probably there's been no vehicles on this road for a very long time. This is a very isolated place on this campsite. So they walk for a little ways on this overgrown logging road until they see there's a turnoff that leads down to the water and this little waterfall. And so right away she saw there was all this brush they were going to need to walk through and the ground looked pretty rough. And Bobby, her youngest, the four-year-old, he didn't have shoes on. He was going through a phase where he refused to wear shoes. And so it hadn't really mattered the entire duration of walking up the road, but it seemed like this might be too much for him to walk on. And so she told Bobby to wait on the road and she told her other son, Jimmy, the six-year-old, to wait next to him. Those two would stay on the road together while she and Bill, the 10-year-old, would go past the brush, go down to the water, check it out for a couple of minutes, and then she would come back, she would pick up Bobby, and Jimmy would come along, and then they would go down and look at the water, and then they would leave. Bobby didn't seem to mind, so he just sat on the road, and Jimmy was a little bit frustrated that he couldn't go with the first group, but he sat down too, and Bill and Edna took off past this brush down to the water. Now, the distance between where Bill and Edna and where Bobby and Jimmy were was only about 10 feet. There was just this brush right in the middle of them that did obscure their view. They could not see each other, but they are very close to each other. And so Jimmy is sitting next to Bobby and he's getting increasingly more and more restless. He wants to go down and look at the waterfall. He wants to be down there with his older brother and his mom. And so at some point he just can't take it anymore. And Jimmy does something that to this day he regrets every single day. And that is he got up and left his brother. He went through the brush down to where Bill and Edna were. And as soon as Edna saw him, she was mad at him. And she goes, what? You left Bobby up there? Come on. And so they turned around after about 60 seconds and went right back up. And when they got back, Bobby was gone. And at first, they're not like, oh my goodness, someone's abducted Bobby because there's no one on this road. They'd come up here and, and recognize that it's very remote, it's isolated, there's no cars that come through here, they hadn't heard anything. And so their first instinct was, okay, he probably got up, you know, and is behind a tree or, you know, he walked down the hill over here or he's nearby. And so they're yelling for him, they're walking around and no one's panicking yet. In fact, really, Edna was just annoyed with Jimmy that he had left, you know, Bobby and that he's to blame right now, but it's just an inconvenience at this point. But after Mother. a couple of minutes when they can't get Bobby to yell back where he is, they start to realize they might have a problem here. And so Edna becomes more panicked and she's yelling at the top of her lungs for her son. She's having her other two sons go look down by the water, go look over there, but there's no trace of him. And they can't believe it. It didn't make any sense because I mean, he's four, he's got no shoes on, they didn't hear anything. How could he be gone? But he was gone. 
And so finally, after a couple of minutes, Edna rounded up her other two boys and they ran all the way back to the campsite where they got Mr. Pankman and they hailed the police. And very quickly, a big search was launched up on that logging road. As soon as the police arrived, the first thing they did is they pressed Edna and the other two boys about what did you hear? You know, you had to have heard something. He was only 10 feet away from you and he was within earshot of you, certainly. You know, what did you hear? Did a vehicle come through? Did you hear an animal? Did you hear anybody talking? And Edna and the other two boys, they swore that they heard nothing, that they're just as baffled by it as anybody else. And so the police really didn't have a good starting point of where Bobby could have gone. And in that area, there wasn't any, you know, steep drop-offs or obvious places that Bobby could have fallen into or gotten trapped. The water for the waterfall, it's not deep. It's this little tiny brook. You know, it's, it'd be difficult to drown in that little brook. So they just... You know, the problem I have with this so far... I just hate when parents expect the kids to watch the kids. You know what I mean? Like getting mad at the kid. Like, why did you leave your brother? You know what I mean? I hate, I see it all the time when I'm in the store. Like, the parent will look at the kid and go, where's your brother? You know, it's like, come on. Like, for real. Especially that young. Like, come on, man into or gotten trapped. The water for the waterfall, it's not deep. It's this little tiny brook. You know, it's, it'd be difficult to drown in that little brook. So they just basically started fanning out in all directions, hoping they would, you know, find a piece of clothing or some other clue that would indicate where he went. After three days of searching that yielded nothing, they finally brought in a bloodhound to try to find him based on scent. And so they had the dog smell one of Bobby's shoes and the dog immediately seemed to key in on his scent in the area where Bobby had gone missing. And the dog turns and starts running up the, the logging road away from the campsite, so farther into the forest. And it runs for almost two miles and it never seems to waver. It's clearly picked up Bobby's scent. And it stops at this fork in the road about two miles away from where Bobby had gone missing. And it keys in on this one area right at the fork where there wasn't anything significant. It was just this bare patch of dirt. And so the police, they uncover the dirt a little bit. There's nothing there. They're looking around the area that there's no indication that Bobby was ever here. So they give the scent back to the dog. And again, the dog just keeps tracking to this one section in this fork in the road but they didn't know what to do with that information because there was nothing there. The search for Bobby was called off after seven days because they could not find anything. Shit. And so the lead investigator came out and did this press release where he basically said, we have no idea what happened to Bobby. However, we do think he was abducted. And his reasoning for this was pretty straightforward. Bobby was a young kid that had no shoes on in an unfamiliar forest and he was only out of eyesight for two minutes. So how far could he really have gotten? Certainly not far enough that his family wouldn't have found him after those two minutes were up and they began looking for him. And so if you go down the abduction rabbit hole, you start with, okay, a person must have taken Bobby. But for a person to take Bobby, that means a person had to be in this area that was super isolated and remote and they hadn't seen anybody in the area and there were very few campers at the campsite. So realistically, if a person was gonna abduct Bobby, they had to have been planning it and had to have been hiding in the trees and were stalking this family until they got to that spot where Jimmy left Bobby and then this person, you know, runs out of the tree line, runs over to Bobby, picks him up without Bobby making a sound, he muffles him and he runs away into the woods carrying this child all in a two minute window, which was a totally abrupt window. It wasn't like this obvious thing that Bobby was gonna be left alone. It looked like Jimmy was gonna be sitting there with him, which would have been a deterrent, you would think, if someone was trying to abduct Bobby. But nonetheless, this window presents itself and this person runs down and takes Bobby. It just seems like that person would need to be really fixated on Bobby, one. And there wasn't a clear reason for why anyone would be very fixated on Bobby or this family. And two, they would need to be very strong and quick and agile, more than the average person. So we're talking like right. a professional athlete level of agility and physical fitness. And so while it's certainly possible that a professional athlete had been stalking this family and then ran down in this tiny little window of time and stole Bobby away without getting detected and then evaded the law for seven days in the middle of the woods, while that's possible, it's pretty unlikely. And investigators reached this conclusion. They thought, you know, it, it does seem pretty unlikely that a person did this. So they moved on to animals and they said, okay, maybe a bear took Bobby. Okay. And so they brought out bear sniffing dogs to search the area for signs that a bear had been there. 
and there hadn't been. And so they said, okay, maybe a cougar had been there. And so they brought out a cougar expert who looked around the area, and there's no signs of a cougar in the area. Plus, there was no blood anywhere around the area where Bobby had been taken. There was no drag marks where if a predator were to grab you, they would need to drag you away. There was no drag marks. So it seemed like, okay, the, the, the large predator theory also has problems with it. And so the next theory offered up was, well, maybe a giant eagle swooped down and picked Bobby up and flew him away, which would account for why maybe it was quiet and there was no drag marks, there was no blood, and why he's just gone. But that was when authorities said, okay, they would have heard him we scream. clearly have no clue. And so that's why they gave the press release and basically said, we just, we just don't know. And so while we probably will never know what happened to Bobby, it does seem likely that something took him. And whatever that something was, it was intelligent, it was fast, it was strong, it was agile, and it had been watching that family. Because as soon as that two minute window presented itself, where Jimmy was gone and Bobby was vulnerable, it swept in so fast that no one heard it, no one saw it, and it took Bobby somewhere and did something to him. And whatever it did, it probably wasn't good. Man. In December of 1961, James McCormick Sr. was on vacation from his job as a fire inspector for the city of Portland, Oregon. And he was feeling bored, he was feeling kind of restless, and he decided he wanted to go do something fun with his 16-year-old son named James McCormick Jr. They settled on going hunting together as they were both avid outdoorsmen, and so they, along with their hunting dog, headed out to Larch Mountain on December 4th. Even though Larch Mountain was only 30 miles from the city, it was known as one of the most rough rugged and wild areas in the northwestern United States. And so the men arrive at Larch Mountain, they're excited, they hop out of the car, they put their gear on, and they begin hiking into the wilderness. Now the weather forecasters had said it was probably going to be pretty cold, there might be some light snow in the area, but the weather should hold for their day trip out into the woods. And so they hadn't brought any equipment to stay out for multiple days. This was just going to be a full day event, but back at night. But after walking for several hours into the mountains, they started to notice the temperature was dropping rapidly. And then it started to rain, and then it started to snow, all in a very short period of time. And initially, they decided they were going to gut it out and keep walking a little ways, but they decided, you know what, this is awful, and our stuff's getting wet, and it's going to get dark soon, so let's just turn around and go back. We can go hunting another day. But it had started snowing so quickly that when they turned around to start making their way back to their vehicle, the snow had covered over everything enough that it looked a little bit different. And they didn't have a GPS, they were using a map and compass, and they were not on a marked trail. They were just kind of walking around the mountains looking for a place to set up. Oh. And so they're walking back and they're making turns and they're starting to question where they are. And when they had walked for several hours in the direction they believed was back to the truck, well, they weren't anywhere near a road and they felt like they were in an area they didn't recognize and they realized they were lost. At this point, it was snowing really hard and it was starting to get dark outside. And so the pair decided, you know what? We gotta stay out for the night. We're just, we're not gonna find our vehicle tonight. It's too dark and we don't know where we are. So let's camp out for the night and tomorrow we will find our vehicle. But remember, they didn't have any equipment to stay out for the night. All they had was their warm clothes, but they didn't have a structure to protect them from the elements. And so they decided their best bet was to climb up into a tree because at least that way they're off the ground. They'd protect themselves from predators potentially and the branches of the tree would kind of protect them a little bit from the snow and from the freezing rain. So that night, James Sr., James Jr. and their dog, they huddle in this tree. It's a totally sleepless, miserable night as they're just destroyed by snow and freezing rain and wind. And then finally the sun comes up the next morning and there's a glimmer of hope, although it's still absolutely dumping snow on them. But they're thinking to themselves, this is gonna make a heck of a story when we get back. And so they climb out of the tree, you know, they stretch, they kind of, you know, readjust themselves. And then they begin walking in a direction that they think is the direction towards their vehicle. And for several hours, they're just kind of walking, hoping they're going to run into this road. And they don't. And at some point they realize once again that they are in the same position they were in the day before. They don't know where they are. And now they've walked even farther, potentially in the wrong direction. And so they stop for a second and James Sr. pulls out his map and he's trying to make sense of where they might be. He's looking around, he's trying to terrain associate to see if he can figure out if there's a specific way he should be going. When his son, who was a really tough kid, didn't complain about anything, he said to his dad, you know, I'm, I'm feeling delirious. Uh -oh. I feel like I can't think straight. 
and it, it's hard for me to stand even. I'm, I'm going to sit down. And his dad's looking at him, not concerned about this, because it was a pretty miserable night the night before, and so it makes sense he might be tired. But, I mean, they had slept a full night's sleep the days leading up to this trip. They've only been out in the elements for one day. They do have warm clothes on. They do have food. They do have water. And so he figures his son will just sit down for a minute, and, and then he'll get back up and be rejuvenated, and they'll keep moving out. And so James Sr. continues looking at his map. He's looking around, kind of waiting for his son to say, okay, you know, I'm ready to start moving again. But his son just continues to deteriorate. He's speaking in nonsense and he can't stand up. And this was the first time that James Sr. really started to feel concerned for their actual safety. Because even the night before when they were up in the tree, even then it just felt like it was this crazy thing that was happening to them and that everything would be fine. And even that morning when they got up and it was still snowing and they're still lost, he had that, that, that optimism and so did his son. But now thinking, okay, we are potentially staring down another night out here and we're gonna eventually run out of food and water. You know, our clothes are starting to get wet. The temperatures are dropping below freezing. We don't have a, a tent, we don't have a shelter. And now something's wrong with my son, which is concerning in and of itself. But if he can't move, then we can't make progress towards getting out of the situation. Exactly. And so James Sr., who was this really fit fireman, he said, okay, I'm gonna pick you up and I'm going to carry you. And he picked his son up, fireman's carry, put him over his shoulders, and for three hours, James Sr. just continues wow. to march around looking for the way out. And after three hours, when they had not gotten anywhere closer to a road or any civilization, and now it was dark out again, he collapses with his son and he puts his son down by a tree and he sits down next to him and he's totally defeated. And he's like, we gotta get ready for another night. We gotta get back up in a tree and we gotta do this again. And so as they're sitting there kind of talking about how they're gonna get James Jr. up into a tree for the night because you know he's too weak to climb up himself, they both notice these very bright lights about 100 feet in front of them that look like headlights. And James Sr. is like, oh my goodness, what luck. There is a road that we just didn't see and there's a car that's parked right there. I'm gonna go up and communicate with them and tell them that we are stuck out here and see if they can give us a ride. Stay right here, I'll be right back. And so James Sr. gets up and starts running towards these lights because these lights are their lifeline and he wants to get to them before they potentially pull away without realizing you know, there's some people that really could use some help here. And so as he's moving, you know, 50, 60, 70 feet away from where his son and his hunting dog were, the lights just continue to go farther and farther away from him to the point where James Sr. stops. And he's looking at these lights thinking, are those headlights? Like, what are those lights? And at some point, the lights just kind of disappear into the forest and then they're gone. James Sr. looks around and he realizes, there's no road over here. I'm in the middle of the woods. Like, what were those lights? And so he stands there for a minute thinking to himself, you know, am I losing my grip on reality? Like, you know, what's going on here? And he turns around and he starts running back to where his son and his dog were. And when he gets there, only his dog is there. Oh, his son no. is now gone. And what's going through James Sr.'s mind is, how? Because he couldn't walk until now. And my son certainly wouldn't have lied to me and made me carry him all the way here. And there's enough light out that he could actually still see the footprints on the ground. And so he grabs his son's backpack that was left by the tree. He picks it up, he grabs his dog, and he starts yelling for his son and starts walking along the footprints that were left by presumably his son. And so he's walking along these footprints and he's yelling out for his son. He's not hearing anything. And this whole time he's thinking to himself, like, why would he even leave? Even even if he could move, why, why yeah, would he leave? Yeah. You know, we're obviously in this together. Like, what's going on with my son? And so he's walking, he's walking. And after about 30 minutes of walking along these footprints, because the snow was coming down so heavy, the prints were getting harder and harder and harder to track because they were filling in with snow. And finally it got dark out and then he really couldn't see the prints anymore. And now James Sr. is absolutely panicked. You know, this is a nightmare. Where's my son? What were those lights? Oh my gosh, it's gonna be another night out here. And he just picks a random direction and holding onto his son's stuff with his dog, he just starts running. The next day, James Sr. and his dog would stumble into this lodge that was about six miles away from where they had parked their car over at Larch Mountain. Now, that doesn't mean they moved six miles to get there. They probably zigged and zagged all over the mountain and they covered much more than six miles, but it was a six mile shot to this lodge. And they stumble inside and it was just a miracle that he had found it. He basically had ran all night until he found a road and he traced it up to this lodge and he told the staff inside, my son is missing. We've been gone for two days now. He's out in the middle of the woods. He's hurt. Someone needs to go out there. 
And so very quickly, the police were called and word spread to the firefighters in Portland, Oregon, that you know the fire inspector's son is missing. And so 200 off-duty firefighters made their way up to the mountain wow. as well to assist in the search. The paramedics wanted James Sr. to just go to the hospital and let the searchers do their job. But James Sr. was not about to leave his son and he refused medical attention and he went out with the first group of searchers. And somehow he was able to get them to the rough area that he was able to recognize as you know roughly where his son had been sitting when he went missing. They searched that area and very quickly Horses. found James Jr.'s glasses case as well as his boots and his socks, but no James Jr. Later in the day though, they would find James Jr. He was about a thousand feet away from where his boots and his glasses case were found at the bottom of this cliff and he was deceased. Now initially the thought was, well, you know, he must have gotten confused and, and walked away from where he had been told to sit and fell off this cliff. But they determined he did not die from the fall off this cliff. He had made his way down to that cliff and then died of exposure. So how was James Jr. able to suddenly be able to walk again? And once he had that skill back, why didn't he go to his dad? Why did he walk away from him? And why did he take his shoes and socks off to do that as well? And what were those lights that James Sr. saw in the middle of the woods? Because they weren't headlights. And it was only when he went to investigate them that suddenly James Jr. up and walks away. What well, what do you call it? Uh, hy hypothermia. It's like I I need ans more answers for that. That that is such a good question. Like, if all of a sudden he was too tired and injured to walk, then he actually gets up and walk, and then goes the opposite way yeah i just felt like felt like he was so delusional and he may start hallucinating i don't know man in early july of 1953 mr and mrs huggin along with their three young daughters left their home in winnipeg canada for a six-week summer vacation they were headed to the girls grandparents summer cabin in wade ontario which is one of the more remote and wild sections of ontario their cabin was right in the middle of this huge swampy forest and they were not too far from one of the biggest lakes in Ontario called Fox Lake. The family arrived late on July 4th, so they didn't do anything when they arrived. They just hung out at the cabin. And then early the next day, all the adults decided they wanted to take the girls to Fox Lake for the day. So they began gathering all the supplies they would need while the three girls played outside the cabin. Now, there's no neighbors or anybody else anywhere near this cabin. And so it was totally normal to have the girls just play outside. They were not concerned about, you know, them getting taken or something. And so the two older girls played in the front yard of the cabin and Geraldine, the five-year-old, was playing on the side of the cabin. So the two girls in front couldn't see Geraldine and the adults, they were keeping their eye on all three girls, but they were mostly just kind of going in and out of the cabin, getting their stuff together, periodically poking their head out, but the girls were fine. At 10 a.m. that morning, the parents had finally packed up the car and they were ready to collect the girls to head over to the lake. And so they went outside, they got the two girls that were out front and they went to the side of the house and they couldn't find Geraldine. Now, they weren't worried because where could she have gone? And so they walked around the house, they're yelling for Geraldine and they asked the two girls, you know, have you seen Geraldine, where'd she go? And they're like, oh, we don't know. She was just over on the side of the house a minute ago. And so they can't find her outside. And so they go in the cabin thinking she must have gone in there because that's the only place she could be. But after thoroughly looking through the cabin and not finding her, they started to get a little bit more worried. At this point, the adults start talking to each other and they're saying, did anybody see Geraldine in the past couple of minutes? Has anybody seen her? And they all said, yeah, I poked my head out the window and I saw her within the past 10 minutes right on the side of the cabin. And so they all agreed within the past 10 minutes they had seen her right outside the cabin. So they're alarmed they can't find her, but they're thinking we're gonna find her. So they go back outside and they're looking around and they're yelling for her. Now this is such a remote section of Ontario that there's really no noise pollution and sound travels really, really well. Mm. And so when they were yelling her name, it was booming through the woods. And even if Geraldine had you know, sprinted for 10 minutes away from the cabin, Jeez. she still easily would have been within earshot. And all she had to do was just you know yell back and they would see her but she didn't yell back and there was no sign of her anywhere. And so at this point, the family is panicking. And so they call the police, the police show up and they're looking around thinking, we're not gonna be able to search this very effectively on our own. This is a huge, wild, remote section of Canada. 
And so they called in some professional trackers that were familiar with this area to come in and help them with their search. They also called the army in Winnipeg to send over some people to assist wow. as well. But as soon as the search started, the skies opened up and dumped rain all over the entire area, basically washing away any footprints that they could have used to potentially find her. As the day wore on and the sun was starting to set and there was still no sign of Geraldine, her father said something to the searchers that was intended to help them find his daughter, but it was just this incredibly heartbreaking comment. And what he told them was his daughter was afraid of the dark. Oh, and that once no. it got dark out in the woods here, she's just going to sit down and cry. And so that will stop her from moving farther away from us, hopefully, and we should be able to find her. But they didn't. And for three days, they looked everywhere for her, and there was no trace of her. And to make matters even worse is the weather had been really rainy and cold, not below freezing temperatures, but close, like in the 40 degree Fahrenheit range. And she just had a light shirt and shorts on. She was not prepared for the weather. On the evening of the third day, they found footprints that they believed to be Geraldine's high up on this ledge in some moss overlooking Fox Lake. And the footprints indicated that this child, which was probably Geraldine, was looking out over the lake and then turned around and walked away from the ledge down into the swamp where her footprints dissipate. And so the search effort was pushed to the swamp and they had thousands of people that are combing through this mosquito infested bush to look for this girl. And once again, there's nothing. Then on the seventh day of the search, they find another set of footprints in the swamp around the area where they were looking for Geraldine. But it wasn't Geraldine's footprints because they were these huge prints that if it was a human print, they would need to be an enormous human being. Or these prints belong to some enormous animal, but they were unable to determine what animal it was. At this point, although there's not really any real evidence connecting that print to Geraldine, people are starting to suspect that whoever left this print or whatever left this print has something to do with whatever happened to Geraldine. Two days later, so nine days after Geraldine has gone missing, some of the professional trackers were two and a half miles away from where that large print was found in that swamp and where Geraldine's footprints were found upon that ledge. They found a piece of her plaid shirt two and a half miles away on the eastern shore of another lake called Long Lake. And so they pushed the search effort over to that section of Long Lake and within 24 hours, they would find Geraldine's remains. Man. The scene where Geraldine was found was bizarre. There was very little left of Geraldine, and from what was left, it was clear there had been significant animal predation. And so initial thoughts were, you know, she must have been attacked by wolves. You know, that that's what killed her. But upon closer inspection, they saw that her clothing had not been torn and there was no blood on her clothes. So the animal predation had most likely occurred after she was deceased because they would have been able to pick around the clothing. Whereas if it had been a wolf attack, they would have cut right through the clothes and there would be marks that obviously, you know, she was attacked by animals. But Geraldine's remains appeared to have been dragged out of a nearby meadow to where she was ultimately located. And so they followed the drag line into this meadow and it led them to this opening where all the grass had been matted down. And investigators said it looked like something big had been laying there. And they speculated that that might have been the area where Geraldine had been killed. And then afterwards, animals had dragged her over to where she was found. And so investigators are like, well, we found that large footprint in the swamp on the seventh day in the same area where we had found Geraldine's footprints and we thought they might be connected. And now we're finding a large, what appears to be body print in this meadow that's right near where Geraldine's remains have been found. And so probably whoever or whatever left that print in the swamp is the same one that left this print here in the meadow and therefore is probably Geraldine's killer. But this left investigators with two theories that didn't really make any sense. The first one was, okay, these prints, the swamp print and this body print belong to an enormous person, like a giant who ran up to the cabin and abducted Geraldine and ran off and no one saw them or heard them. And for weeks, they've managed to totally evade capture despite being, again, an enormous person lumbering through the forest. So that seemed really unlikely. One, that this giant person even existed. And two, that if this giant person existed, how could they not get caught? They're so big running through the forest, they would be easy to spot. But if you rule out the enormous person theory, you're left with the enormous predator theory, which does make more sense on the surface because there are enormous predators that have attacked humans, so that does happen. But when they looked at her remains, they ruled out a wolf attack, and really, they ruled out animal attacks. But if this is an enormous predator, how did it kill Geraldine? 
The family was told that unfortunately, because there wasn't enough left of her, they weren't able to determine a cause of death. And so their best guess is she was probably mauled by wild animals, but they would even level with the family and say, honestly, we don't know what did this. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's video, That first one with the mother leaving the kids, or leaving, bringing the kids out, one of them ain't got no shoes, like, oh. Every time I listen to this, bro, it's like, it, I mean, technically it is a show, but like, I could listen to this, brother, like in a movie theater, just narrating just so much stuff. But yeah, like, that just make me think of all the craziness or things that, like, when people be saying they be seeing stuff in the woods, that's why I don't go camping. Mm -mm. Oh, no. No, no, no. All right, you guys. Again, appreciate y'all coming over and watching, man. Make sure y'all subscribe to his channel. Peace out.